Hi folks. We continue to worship virtually with online services. We're preparing to meet in person and we'll be sending out information soon that will give all the details necessary. Today, Bishop Michael will be joining us online to share the gospel as part of the summer sermon series. God calls us now more than ever to love our neighbor and to be together while we remain apart. Come, let us worship God as we celebrate the Lord's Day on this 13th Sunday at Pentecost. We begin with a family-friendly message, and now this. In this week's reading from the Gospel, Jesus has been talking with his disciples and teaching them. And then this is how some of them respond. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? And then later on it says, Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. A few of them said, many of them said, this is just too much. I can't handle this right now. But you'll notice they're still called his disciples. They are still accepted. They are still disciples. So what is it that they're being asked to do? We are called to act with justice. We are called to love tenderly. called to love, to serve, to act with justice, to make the world a better place. And that sometimes is hard. Sometimes because we're feeling grumpy. Sometimes because when we're trying to make justice, we have to challenge some people who could do some mean things to us. And some days we just say, it's too much. But that doesn't mean that we are not loved. In the Bible, it didn't mean that they were no longer disciples. It just meant that in that moment, it was too much. But the wonderful thing is, at the end of the day, we have a sleep, we get up the next day, and it's another day. And God still loves us and they were still his disciples. And then we're invited again. How about today? Are you ready to seek justice? Are you ready to love? Are you ready to do these wonderful things? How are you going to respond to God's love? Because God's love is always there. We are always accepted as we are. And we're invited to do something about it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Blessed be the Lord our God. Who satisfies our hunger and thirst for truth with living water and the bread of life. with a promise to love and be present. Let's pray. Ever-loving God, your Son gives himself as the bread of life for the world. Fill us with such a knowledge of his presence that we may be strengthened in faith and hope to be your servants in the world today. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. reading from John's sixth chapter. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Dear friends in Christ, it's a privilege to be with you as a part of this morning's worship and to be able to give your dear pastor some much welcome relief. Our rostered ministers have been doing such a wonderful job over the course of the past year and a half, but it's hard work and we need to do everything we can to give them our encouragement and support and I'm glad to be able to help in this small way. In today's epistle and gospel lessons, we are provided with some incredibly rich and evocative images of what it means to live a Christian life. They are also challenging images that have been understood in different ways throughout the church's history. Today's epistle from Paul's letter to the Ephesians reads as follows. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God 
so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. I must confess that I find the martial, uh, militarized language of this text difficult. It may be that I've been overly sensitized by my summer's reading of the full five-volume, 5,000-page-plus five Game of Thrones series. As fun as it's been, I've pretty much had my fill of breastplates, helms, swords, and shields. But I'm also quite aware of the destructive ways in which Christian people have seen the life of discipleship through militaristic lenses. The images of battle and conquest have been used by Christians to engage in evil acts that are completely at odds with the gospel of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. And as such, we need to be extremely careful in how we read and express such imagery. I'm heartened, however, that the passage is framed with the counsel that we arm ourselves with whatever is necessary to proclaim the gospel of peace. That is the real point here. And although the imagery used is all about arming for violent battle, the real strength that is advocated is not the might of armies, but rather the world reconciling power of the Prince of Peace who himself was the victim of a violent and oppressive regime. Certainly evil exists, and yes, we need to combat evil, but we do so by arming ourselves, not with weaponry, but with the virtues of righteousness, peace, faith, and the word of God. <clears throat> Hence, I find it really helpful to read this Ephesians passage alongside other discipleship descriptions employed by Paul such as this passage from his letter to the Colossians, where he writes, As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Today's gospel likewise holds a few theological pitfalls of which we need to be careful. This is now our fifth and final Sunday dwelling within John chapter 6. And for four of those, we've been moving our way through Jesus' bread of life discourse that he gave at the synagogue in Capernaum. For most of us, the phrase bread of life is well known and often used in our churchly discourse, almost casually. But that was not the case for Jesus' listeners in the synagogue at Capernaum. For many, it would have been deeply offensive. And we read that the people complained and they grumbled. This is difficult. Who can accept it? Many simply turned and walked away that day. Have you ever considered the possibility that Jesus might well have preached more people out of the kingdom than into it? For some who walked away that day, I suspect that they couldn't consider anything other than a quite literal interpretation of Jesus' words. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? This is cannibalism. This is a, a grotesque abomination. To which some of us might respond, but wait a minute. This is clearly a reference to the Eucharist. Jesus is speaking of his presence in the Holy Communion. But if that's really the case, I 
I don't know how Jesus could have expected his listeners to get it. Uh, the Last Supper, the event which Christians subsequently viewed as the first Eucharist, the first Holy Communion, of course it hadn't yet occurred. And the first record of a liturgical reenactment of that event in something resembling what we call Holy Communion is found in 1 Corinthians, which wasn't written until about 55 years after Jesus' death. Ah, but Bishop, you and I both know that the Gospel of John was probably written between 90 and 100 years after Jesus' death. Its authors would have been part of a Eucharistic community that was conversant with using these images in this way. Maybe in crafting the gospel, they were putting words in Jesus' mouth or perhaps phrasing them in such a way as to affirm their own churchly practices and theological constructs. Perhaps. And there are certainly some scholars who would support that particular interpretation. But when I look at the whole of John 6, that whole discourse, in the context of the whole Gospel of John, and when I look to a broad range of biblical scholars, I've come to a different conclusion. And I think what Jesus is really talking about here is incarnation. The Word, the Logos, about God entering into the life of God's own creation and becoming flesh. I think some of Jesus' listeners would have heard him saying that. And it was that. It was that earth-shattering theological construct that they found to be at worst offensive and at best simply impossible to believe. I think that it was and still is almost unimaginable that God so loved the world, so loved God's creation, that God chooses to enter into that world certainly in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, but also through Jesus into us, into God's beloved creation, so that we might have true and lasting life and have it abundantly. Luther seminary theologian Carolyn Lewis describes it this way. This is truth, because at the end of the day, life, real life, life lived, abundant life, is hard to fathom, hard to accept, hard to imagine that it could be yours. Judas's betrayal that's referenced at the end of chapter 6 is fundamentally a rejection of relationship, but it's also an unwillingness to receive life beyond measure, an inability to accept that abundant life could be true, a reluctance to envision, to dream, to picture that when God said God loves the world, that it actually meant him and means you. That's powerful. And it's that relationship, as intimate and nourishing as eating and drinking can be, that God in Christ entering into our lives, into our existence, it is that that gives us both the will and the means to clothe and arm ourselves in the way that Paul describes to the Ephesians and to the Colossians. Our gospel lesson today concludes with Jesus asking a question to his disciples. Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. May Peter's response be our response. Amen.
us is to hear us and answer us in love. Lord, especially in the world today, we pray for the people of Haiti, and we pray for the people of Afghanistan. Grant them a measure of your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, Help us to be your church in a world that needs so much. Be with those who suffer from wildfires, flooding, drought, and landslides, the effects of climate change around the world. Protect those who suffer violence and civil war. Keep us faithful to your message of love and mercy, that all may know the good news of your grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all nations, open our hearts and minds to listen patiently to our indigenous neighbors and support as we can, make changes that we can, and strive to live into God's justice, peace, and reconciliation. Grant healing to your people, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of healing and wholeness, we pray for all who stand in special need. We pray for those in long-term care, hospital and those who are sick and dying, those who grieve and those who struggle to cope hour by hour, day by day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, you know our needs and our weaknesses. Abba, Father, we pray for ourselves, for rest, for courage, and for strength to follow you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of all, bread of life, we thank you for the signs of hope you bring for the easing of restrictions and the joyful reunions that follow, for simple acts of kindness and generosity of spirit. We thank you for the gift of science that is saving lives. Continue to guide us now as the pandemic inflicts so many in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we lift our prayers to you those we speak, those that are silent, and those that only you know, trusting in the promise of your mercy and grace through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all.
God of justice and love. We give our thanks to you that you show us the way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the faith we need to follow you, awakening us to the needs of others and the hope of a better world to come, as you have promised through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let's pray now as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil for the kingdom power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor 